All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, another Project Felix discussion. This time uh, we're just discussing the uh, popular term of resilience or being resilient. Uh, we'll start off. I'm Mario. I'm one of the main guys behind Project Felix. Been doing this for a little over two years. Retired Air Force EOD. Uh, here with my friends, and uh, I'll pass along Brad to you. AKA B Rad, as they call me. Uh, I like slow runs on the pavement instead of long walks on the beach, and uh, terrible puns, and blowing things up. Also, I've been doing that for a little while. It's pretty fun. And uh, I'm gonna pass the mic to Jason. Where, Hi, where? I'm, I'm, a, I'm Jason Numloff. I'm an active EOD tech in the Air Force. I will eventually retire, but I probably won't have beautiful hair like Mario does. It's gone. So uh, that's it for me. I'm uh, Tracy or Paz, uh, also Air Force EOD. Uh, I enjoy some of those slow runs myself. Uh, the only thing I like more is probably commander's calls on Friday afternoons and possibly anything to do with computer based tracing training. So yeah, let's get resilient. <laughs> well, thank you for those uh, wonder and wonderful and super official intros. Um, I'm going to start off with a. Uh, usually we start off with a quote of a book sounding all fancy and stuff. This time we decided to uh, kind of start with the official definition of resilience. Um, and the main reason for that is we've talked about this kind of behind the scenes, but there seems to be kind of the pop culture. Uh, the popular uh, definition for it, but then kind of a different on the ground what it actually means to us definition. Uh, so we're going to start off with this. This is from psychologytoday.com. It talks about resilience. It says, resilience is the psychological quality that allows some people to be knocked down by the adversities of life and come back at least as strong as before. Rather than letting difficulties, traumatic events, or failure overcome them and drain their resolve, highly resilient people find a way to change course, emotionally heal, and continue moving toward their goals. So that's, that's kind of the A, a standard uh, definition of resilience. Um, so I guess I kind of wanted to open the floor uh, to to the remaining uh, people just to see what's your guys' take on the differences between what resilience comes across as nowadays and kind of what you think it is or how you incorporate it into your daily lives. Um, what do you guys have on that? Any thoughts? So I think resiliency is viewed as a corporate buzzword right now because to an extent it's being pushed down your throat. And if you don't know anything about it, people just shove it aside. It's something that the corporate culture wants us to believe in because they're supposed to tell us that. On the individual level though, I think if you read in into what resiliency is about, you know, clearly it's a, it's a great tool or a skill set to have to help navigate through this crazy life we live. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's my initial thoughts on it. It's it, it sounds like your take on it is more of it's it's coming down as a CYA, almost like a check the box uh, type thing that if people just tell you, hey, be resilient or, or are you being resilient today? Um, that it's they've done their job. They've 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 taking you in the right direction but um <laughs> what we've been talking about uh before this conversation and probably the last couple of years is uh there's a whole lot more to it uh than just that um brad what what are we missing what are we missing on the ground um it seems like there's a big gap between what's being put out and what is. What are we missing as far as resiliency in your opinion? 
uh, I would say it, it's almost become like an expectation thing. Like you are expected to get knocked down, pick yourself back up and keep going and that's it. And, and just keep doing that. Right. And then what do they say? Like if, if you have trouble doing that, Oh, just go to mental health. Right. Well, those, those aren't good ways to think about it at all. In my personal opinion, like, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't go to mental health by any stretch. Absolutely do that. Um, if needed, but I think it's become the expectation, like, uh, most of us, us all being EOD, right? Uh, I would like to think most of us are probably perfectionists, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this job. We've kind of got a, a motto that sort of lines up with that, right? Initial success or total failure. Um, and I think like that same thing has become the expectation all the time. Just like, uh, you know, in some forms of American culture, we have other expectations. Like, I want everything fast, I want it done right, and I want it affordable or cheap, right? And like, you never get those three things um, all at the same time. You only get two at most, right? But um, I think that's where we're setting ourselves up for failure is expecting people to just be resilient. Um, and there's like what's missing is understanding the person. Um, and, and every person is different and every person comes from a different background and every person has a different network of support around them or has none at all. And that is what we really need to be looking into is who, not just in the military, but and this is like a societal cultural thing. Like where are people coming from? Are they coming from a broken home? Are they coming from uh, being neglected as a child? And, and you know, I, I'll never get off my ACE soapbox because it just has so many impacts throughout your entire life. And it's important to not dismiss those. But uh, I can't remember which book it was. If it was, I think it was either Tribe or Men the Mission and Me. I think it was Tribe. Um, the author talked about how many people run from problems to the military, and then we expect them to show up and just be ready to go and be mission ready. And like I remember uh, when I was at the schoolhouse as an instructor, I was in nukes at the time, the very last division, and one of our leaders there was telling us how we had to be sending out full up rounds to the field, and it's like. That's not why we're here, man. We're here to make sure people can be trained to be EOD techs, not to send them to the unit and be ready to freaking deploy two seconds later. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is, do you have what it takes to be trained, right? And uh, I think that's that's what it comes back to is we want everything right now. We want it to be right, and that's it. And everything else in between gets lost in the sauce, and, and people don't take the time to take a step back and appreciate, understand, and, and try to, un or try to understand it. And I think that's where we miss the mark an awful lot. And I uh, recently, for those of us still in, Chief Bass published uh, the Enlisted Force Development Action Plan. And on page nine, they talk about resilience, right? And there's this thing about in there about how it's supposed to be, right, from the top, supposed to be done at like a unit level and all that. And I sent it out to a couple of uh, friends of mine at my last duty station in the reported high ops tempo careers, which I'm not trying to suggest they're not, but it's the ones that always come up, maintainers and cops, right? I sent it to a couple of those guys and like, hey, what are you guys going to do about this? And I'm like, oh, we don't have time for that shit. Like, this is going from the top. Like, there's the problem, <laughs> right? People's mission is uh, taking over everything and they're not making time for it. They're not making time for giving a shit about their people. And I said, five or 10 minutes once a week, you can't make time for that. And they said, absolutely not. Uh, how? How can't you make time for five or 10 minutes to give a shit about people, right? And I'm not trying to say that that's the entire career field across the board. That's just a tiny, 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 tiny sample of people that I knew and I talked to that I knew would be honest with me. Um, I don't know if that's the way it is across the whole entire career field. And I'm not trying to suggest that it is. However, I, I would suggest that that theme is probably there in many places. Um, I don't know. I feel like I kind of wandered all over the place, but I could talk about this for 24 hours straight. <laughs> yeah, no. And again, going back what Jason mentioned, it, it, it seems like the term resilience is this nice big level packaged uh, like, you know, the big old school clown hammer. You know, it's like, oh, here's a problem. Let's use the resilience hammer and just beat it beat it with that but i think un unpacking that term uh 
and looking at some of the factors that go into resiliency or you know the the ability to uh, get through hardship and and not let it break you but maybe instead learn the places where one can bend whether it, at least in an individual or a team or an organization where you can bend here and there maybe temporarily to get through things Wh what do you think paz oh i think you know as we've gone around this first first kind of go around just looking at you know setting a stage of defining out what resiliency is and it, i don't think that it's uncommon for people to understand what resiliency means or i don't also, I guess I should say, I believe that inherently people themselves are resilient. Because you look at where you were to where you are now to where you're going, and there's going to be tough things along the way. And, you know, but but as we frame the conversation to what we are right now, looking at, I guess, it sounds like we're discussing you know, from almost like an organizational standpoint, and in this instance, the Air Force, we go, okay, they, they being the Air Force, know we need people to continually be resilient to all of these changes in these tough situations that we put you in. So we know why we need to be resilient and we know what resiliency is. To me, right now, this conversation is centering around how do we go about it? And we look at it either really large from organizationally or all the way down to the unit or the individual level. And I think what you'll find when you go down those different levels is that what works for the how piece of an organization is not necessarily the same as what works for a small group or even an individual. You're going to have to apply different, I, I guess we'd use the term tactics, right? Uh, as you you know, sharpen that, sharpen that knife and get down to the fine point of like a person or a small group of people, you have to have those interpersonal relationships like Brad was alluding to. Get to know your people, spend that 10 to 15 minutes if that's all you've got on a weekly basis to, to put out, you know, and, and do it in a fashion that makes sense to those, those few people that you're talking to. You have to, by definition, be broader and more general the further you go up the organization. So I don't think that it's necessarily that the big Air Force, you know, as we've talked about, and I don't want to put blame on it, it's just them, but an organization coming up with individual and small unit plans is not, I, I don't see a way where they could be successful with that. Where we have to, where we have to do better is the leaders at those tactical, you know, small locations doing better on a daily basis. Now, how do you go about that? I don't know. I have some ideas. We incentivize how people are doing. You know, I don't necessarily rate you on uh, how great of an NCO per se that you are by how's that program look. I look at the success of your people and I go, man, I don't see a lot of successful people underneath you. Why is that? What are you doing to to improve you know the people that work for you because you know it ties into that whole transformational leadership path that that we you know talk about from the very beginning in the air force so i don't think resiliency comes up that much differently in that plan it has to be the way brad was talking i do i do think we need to improve the immediate you know immediate supervisors and that unit level and and I, th I think that to me is where the disconnect is at. So I'll pause because I know I threw a lot of stuff out there. <laughs> no, I, I think I think that's great. You're, you're talking. It's, it sounds like you're alluding to uh, the importance of good leadership at the front line supervisor level. Uh, I know that was hugely instrumental in me being able to make a career out of the military instead of being kicked out the first couple years I was in the Air Force. Um, and a, a, an example I wanted to bring up recently was you, Jason. Uh, you, you posted something on Facebook. Uh, you went out on a hike, I think, recently, and you took one of the guys from your shop. 
He had some really nice things to say about that. Um, you know, set, you know, it, going out for a hike, uh, pretty much, uh, in my eyes, is as good sometimes, if not better, than you know, medication or something like that. And uh, I at least wanted to give you, you know, like public kudos that that I thought that was pretty cool. And I I would view that as a, a really good example of leading by example. So, you know, um, I got to take that, you know, from a page out of the Brad Klein handbook, you know, getting out and, and doing this stuff. But honestly, it wasn't me that that uh, had that it up. That was uh, Devin Long. You know, he's been trying to do that for his own personal well-being. And he said nothing but good things about, you know, just taking hikes out to new places and seeing new views that most people will never get to see in their lives. Um, so he invited me out for it. And I was very happy to do that we actually went out twice that same day we left about 4 30 in the morning to get to one point super foggy but it was about the journey you know on that one uh and then we went again that evening and we almost died in a lightning storm so there was a little bit of a thrill to that one but um in terms of like posting about it you know i think it's great to share those things just to give other people options so like hey instead of sitting in your in your living room why don't you go out and do something and you be the person to take these pictures and you know get the the mental exercise out of it you know it, it was great but yeah no that's that's definitely uh uh up my alley as far as you know nature therapy or just just getting outside and doing something you know uh i know brad was mentioning uh the journey on his uh motorcycle recently and uh, coming back from the Pittsburgh area, I don't know if Brad, you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I thought that was a really good example. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I bought a motorcycle in Pittsburgh. I live in Southern Maryland now, and uh, I took a one-way rental car up there, and I picked it up yesterday. Uh, tried to get there as soon as I could, but time schedules did what they did, and I wound up not leaving until two. And um, I rode back down, nothing, no highway, no tolls, nothing, just all back roads. So it took me an extra like two hours, but who cares, right? Because that's a, the journey is a huge part of it, especially on a motorcycle and uh, slabbing places on highways. And you don't want to do that because you have to get somewhere fast. So I try to avoid having to get anywhere fast if I can help it. Uh, but, you know, typically, normally what I would do, I would find myself at a point where it's like I'm starting to get tired and I'm starting to get achy and whatever. And I'm like, ah, screw it. I'll just push through and. I'll just get there tonight so I can save $70, $80 on a hotel room and call it good, whatever. And um, I got to Winchester, Virginia, and I decided, you know what? I'm going to not do the normal, what I normally would do. I'm going to get a hotel room, and I'm just going to go get some local town grub, and I'm going to go to bed at my old man bedtime, like right when the sun goes down, 9 o'clock, and I'm going to be able to wake up at 5.30, no problem, probably even without an alarm because get off my lawn. But uh, <laughs> uh, that's exactly what I did. And because of that, I got to see and experience some things that I would not have otherwise. So, you know, uh, like those things were just absolutely incredible sights. I was riding through the Blue Ridge Mountains at sunrise. So I just got to see, to me, like the Blue Ridge and the Shenandoah Valley is just Americana because it's just rolling hills and farms like everywhere. And that's what I think of when I think of at least like the East Coast. It makes me think of like the Civil War and the start of America and all that kind of stuff, rode through George Washington's birthplace and things like that. Uh, but I would not have got to see that if I would have just pushed through and said, ah, screw it. I can, I can suck it up. I can, I can just uh, be resilient to the, the aches and pains and uh, mental fatigue and just drive another two hours on the highway and get home quicker and be home tonight and sleep on my $100 air mattress instead of a hotel room bed because I'm still waiting for my household goods. <laughs> but um, like to me, that comes back to like, you know, you talk about what is resilience and a lot of times it's putting your head down and pushing through things. And there are instances and times where that might have you miss opportunities. Um, you might not be able to, you know, have a little bit of mindfulness and to be able to take a step back and appreciate some things. Like I never would have ridden those roads that I rode this morning. And I never would have seen those roads at sunrise and maybe I'll never see them again. I don't know, but I would have never had that opportunity if I would have said, Alice, just suck it up and get through this. You know? Yeah, Brad, I, I, I think you, you hit on, 
you know, with that story, a big, I think something that bears discussion when it comes to resilience. Um, I think a very common definition of resilience resides around put your head down, keep fighting forward, where we go, you know, keep fighting, keep up, keep up the fight, keep pushing, where perhaps a better definition or, you know, an argument could be made that resilience is really about adaptability and adapting to the situation as, as it either happens or or did happen, something didn't go the way you planned, but our ability to be resilient has to do with being, a, you know, being adaptable enough to continue to move forward. And we don't view that, well, this didn't work out this way, so I will never get past it. You know, that permanency, you know, it takes us back to the impermanence discussion. It, it takes us back to, you know, we, we, we've stressed learning to be more adaptable by getting out of our comfort zones. Every one of us has, has been part of those conversations. We recorded them. We put that out there as, as, as our words, what we've read about, what we believe. And I, and I think to me, as I'm hearing this unfold, it feels the same way that, you know, that adaptability to the situation at hand is is a is as much if not more a part of resilience as put your head down and fight put your head down and push forward yeah no those are good points when we talked about um we've talked about it in in times past i think brad was the first person that actually brought it up was white knuckling and you know you mentioned you mentioned your own version of it earlier about head down push forward um i think there are times where that's necessary there are times to white knuckle and you know like <laughs> i think about the, the the individuals on normandy uh they had to push through like I, 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 it's, it's really hard for me to imagine uh, the amount of resilience that those individuals had, you know, but maintaining that constantly white knuckling, like indefinitely, that's not resilience, like putting head down and constantly pushing through no matter what, you're going to fall on your face eventually. Uh, sometimes I think that happens to different people at different points in their lives, depending on what they're going through. Um, it's happened to me several times. I'm, I'm, I'm a habitual learning the hard way type person, um, <laughs> but I'm still here. So, you know, uh, I don't think there are situations, there are probably times where I've been less resilient but I think overall is where that resiliency has led to but um bump post traumatic growth and learning and all that stuff which we've talked about before. Um, but there it's it, that looks different for for each individual, you know, based off of you know uh, their own level of quote unquote common sense, which in my opinion doesn't really exist anymore. Um, but you know for some people going through hardships of type a or type b is just commonplace and they tend to you know be able to roll with those punches a little bit better than others but then there are others that they go through c and d and so on and so forth and it just looks different for different people and that's trying trying to distill some of the uh how do i say this the common denominators of resilience i think is one of the things that we've been trying to do especially with brad's uh rhetorical question of what happens when we're not resilient brad that uh something you were talking about while you're talking uh kind of taking a little bit of a step back but uh maybe think of System one, system two, react versus respond. 
type situations really you know if you're in a situation where you need to react like that's not the time to consider like do i need to be resilient right now or not like you know life and death situations essentially yeah you got to do what you got to do and you figure out the rest later and i think that comes back to thinking about like uh even you know for us like an eod operation that's like you have certain instances during those operations where you can take some time and think through it and be thoughtful and respond and then there's other times where you need to react with how you were trained to whatever the hell is happening. And you will have to be forced to address that later. And I think that's also where some challenges come is when, and just like what you're talking about, what happens when you're not resilient? What happens when, and I just thought about this now, you don't have time to even think about being resilient until later. Uh, will you, are you going to, are you going to like address that? Or are you just going to sit there and, you know, have those, uh, intrusive thoughts and uh, constant replays going in your mind. And what will you do about it when that happens? Uh, will you be resilient or won't you? I don't know that that's necessarily the question. I think the question is more like, what can you do about it? Where will you go from there? Uh, because, you know, I think that's, that's really important. And that's when you have the time to be thoughtful about it, it's important to do that. Tracy? Yeah, as you as you explain that, it, it made me think back that that you know once again, perhaps we're not given some due diligence to the lives we've led through uh, our EOD, our shared EOD experience, right? Uh, because what you talked about is you know you're going to get done with this, and am I going to take that time to go back and be resilient? What what do we, I I know every everybody here is going to give me the same answer. What do we do at the end of our ops? Why why did you get better? Because you went back at the end of it, and if you were transparent and honest with your team members or being a team member, you know, telling your team leader at the end of it, being like, yeah, we did this, and yeah, so it turned out okay. However, this is, I didn't understand this, or this happened, and I made, you know, as the team leader, like, I made this decision, and then you hear from your team member, they're like, oh, yeah, no, the we were baffled by that decision because you didn't know this. And, and, you know, so so once again, organizationally, I think there's a lot of structure there that we sometimes forget to put into our personal lives. You know, uh, we've all been in this and it's and it's so inherent to the things you're comfortable with or that you know, I know at the end of an op, I know at the end of an exercise, I know at the end of an assignment, there is a scheduled time to reflect, to look at what has gone on, whether it's an exit interview, depending, you know, it, it takes many forms. It's out there, but there is nobody that tells me when something's going on in my life that now is a time, maybe you should, like you said, take that take that knee for a second, take a, take a pause, you know, okay, hold on, I gotta think about this for a second. You know, because the structure in your personal life might not be there. I don't know. It's what I thought of when Brad was explaining that. You made me think of an, uh, something that I learned from Ryan Manzi, and it kind of relates to all this, you know, focusing on things that are not always rosy and whatever. But uh, basically, he was telling me one time about a response he had, deployment, whatever. He rolls up on scene like, yeah, there's an IED down the road. And uh, he's like, all right, cool. You know, uh, I'll deal with that. And the army unit that he was supporting, they were baffled by him, like not really putting a whole lot of thought into it at the moment. And he said to them, he's like, listen, I know where the IED's at. It's cool. It's not going anywhere. I'm more concerned about all the unknowns at this point, all the things that I can't see. And I think it kind of relates to the resiliency of every aspect of life. You know, we can look at, oh, everything is so happy and great. And I got cheerleaders, you know, screaming in my ear, oh, the Air Force is great. This is great. You know, whatever. It's like, well, what about the things that aren't great and how can we make them better? And it, it made me think of that. So, Yeah, I, I look at those as opportunities for improvement. Like, I've never been okay with just accepting things as they are. Like, that's great. And I should just shut up and be be happy that I have that. Like. My gears are always turning. I always talk about the OODA loop. You know, how can we make this better? Is this is this where we are or can we make it better? And, um, you know, it, it's, it's not constantly being critical for the sake of being critical. It's 
improving it because I think ultimately we're trying to leave things better for the people coming behind us. We, we've always said that we're trying to train our replacements because we're not always going to be in that role. The people coming ahead are always looking to us. What are we doing and trying to emulate it? But yeah, Tracy, you and your noodle loop. <laughs> I do love noodles. <laughs> uh, thank you for a little uh, bit of go that back to comic the, uh, relief. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Brad. Uh, going back to the what happens when we aren't resilient, I think that's a, a question, if you want to say like organizationally or culturally or socially, that, that we don't really address too well, if at all. And uh, I think that's where we're missing out on some opportunity uh, because, you know, what is being resilient? Being resilient is not letting things beat you down, right? In the end of it, right? Um, and what we're trying to tell people, like if I go back to this definition here, you know, rather than letting difficulties, traumatic events, or failure overcome and drain their resolve, resilient people find a way to charge, change course, emotionally heal, and continue moving th toward their goals. So there can be some PTG tied into that. However, I think what we wind up doing is we have this focus on you don't let these things uh, beat you down and you just immediately are, are right back there. And I think that's the issue. Like what are traumatic events, right? Um, from coddling in the American mind, words are not violence, right? I can call you a name. I can say horrible things about you or to you. That is not violence. Punching you in the face is violence, right? I cannot punch you in the face with my words. Um, and so it's important to realize that there's a scale there and everybody interprets that scale slightly differently. However, there is also a bottom of that scale where if if words are trauma to you, then, you know, maybe then you should look at being a little bit more resilient is kind of, you know, my personal take. Maybe that's callous, crass, I don't know. Um, but if somebody saying something to you has the same effect as one of your parents dying or some of your friends being killed in a car accident or in combat operations in our sense, like you need to reevaluate some things, right? Follow that up with when those things happen, you should not, I think where we run into issues is everybody thinks they have to be resilient right away, right? What happens when we go to funerals? Like put on a strong face, be strong, whatever. I saw this happen. Um, I won't name names because, you know, didn't ask them permission or whatever, but at, at some family funerals, a person in my family being super, super strong the whole day, right? And then a detonation of emotion at the, at the end of the night, right? Which one is healthier? You know, maybe there's a little bit of wiggle room in there, maybe, maybe a little bit more of both, I don't know. Um, but I think like that's where we run into issues of what happens when you're not resilient? Well, just go to mental health. There's the checkbox, right? Um, <laughs> my question about that, as Mario, you were there and you have more to deal, deal with it than I did that situation at McGuire. What happens when mental health says come back in two weeks? Now what are you supposed to do, right? How do you deal with that when you have somebody who made an attempt, made a legitimate suicidal attempt, and you go into the office, this isn't to put down mental health. Uh, the whole entire country's mental health system is kind of broken, I think. Uh, they're understaffed and overtasked. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that they tell you, come back in two weeks. What are you going to do now? Right. That's what I want to ask the leaders who say, be resilient. And when you're not go to mental health, because they're not putting any thought or effort into it. Right. And I, I'm not trying to suggest that every leader in the Air Force thinks that way. Uh, I think we have some great leaders in great positions that do not think that way. And they're trying to figure out what they can do from their position. But going back to what Paz said earlier, I don't know that it's their position that makes the most change. I think it's down at the much, much lower tactical levels at the NCO levels, senior NCO levels where that change really actually happens. And we get support from the top, but there's, you know, <laughs> oh, here we go. Here's that PME term, right? A business climate crap. That frozen middle doesn't want to change, right? Because change is scary and change is hard. People don't want to actually care about people. They want to just care about a mission because it's easier. Um, you don't have a mission if there's no people. So if you keep running your people into the ground, you've got nothing and you're not thinking ahead. You're only thinking two inches in front of your face. Maybe a suggestion, you know, to the leaders at the top, they could maybe pull some of the mission back a little bit in some ways. 
to allow that to happen. Now that's maybe wishful thinking, rose colored glasses and, oh, you do that and people are just gonna be lazy and slack off. I don't know, try it, see what happens. But what's the worst that happens? You, you lose a couple of sorties a month. I mean, I know that's friggin' hacks, bust out the garlic, but I don't know. I'm just just trying to spitball here. One of the things that, that, that came to mind when, because we have these discussions a lot about what happens when you're not resilient. What do you do? The one thing that stands out to me when I talk about uh, distilling some of the lowest common denominators that, you know, some c simple concepts that you can apply at everything from the individual level to an organizational level. For me, the number one thing is sometimes the pace has to slow down a little bit, maybe temporarily. Um, I know that the way that I kind of look at things is I always want to end the day in the plus category rather than the minus. Like, and what I mean by that is, did I put forth, did I accomplish things, you know, I've got positive things over here and then I've got things that I didn't do so well, maybe in, in inappropriate reactions or things that I said or didn't get done or something versus, you know, a good thing that I did here. I ultimately try and stay, end up in the positive. And for a long time, there was this, there was this uh, urgency to just keep going, keep going, keep going, like you talked about, head down and just and just keep going there's nothing wrong with the pace slowing down a little bit if if you don't end up with like five pluses that day it's okay to end with just one plus or even a zero because guess what there's another day coming full of opportunities to start that all over again and sometimes the pace needs to slow down, whether it be a day, you need to take a couple days of leave, go out for a hike or something like that. Like it's not constant. But, you know, Paz, you were mentioning like in life, you know, you, you have the team and you have people there to help you accountable. Sometimes, you know, after that, you know, in like normal family life, there isn't a mechanism to say, hey, man, you need to sustain this. These are your improves and these are your recommendations. Like there's no mechanism to tell you that. So sometimes I guess in my mind, the individual pace needs to slow down. And Brad, you alluded to the pace of sorties as well. And that's kind of higher level stuff. What do you guys think about that concept? of slowing the pace down temporarily as needed and then adjusting accordingly. Paz. Um, I think I, I, I like it. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll start with that, but I, I think kind of back at the beginning of the conversation, Brad mentioned uh, people are individuals. Now we joined a bigger piece. All of us, we decided to join the Air Force and there was laid out for us these are the expectations, whether they be for core values, whether they be for institutional competencies, it doesn't matter. There is, there's this uh, standard or expectation associated with that. And people bring from their backgrounds these, these different perspectives, these different skills. And I think you see it in all walks of life. Uh, an example I would give on that is I go home on leave and I want my two boys to help me gather up some firewood and bring it over to where we're going to have a campfire. They have two different ways of doing things and you can overwhelm them in different ways. My oldest son, very analytical thinker, he he does things and he does them at his pace. You can yell till you're blue in the face. All you are going to do is make him anxious and make him gun shy. He will get it done and it will be done correctly and he will never have to go back. He, but it's going to take a while. We joke about it. We, we, we tease about it. My youngest son just wants to go in and get it done. He might have to go back three times to get the pieces of wood he forgot to pick up or go put a tool back that he left out. And him, you can, you can get after him and be like, hey, 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 
you know, and he's going to pick his pace up. Now, there's still anxiety associated with that. There's still, but it manifests in a different way. And it takes us back to each person being an individual and reacting to different things in different ways. You know, you're going to have things that come up in your life. And maybe for your life, it's the biggest thing that you're going through. That's all that matters. You know, but when it comes to the resiliency, I I see it as, I see it the way Brad does of, People are individuals and they're going to react to things differently. And I think what really comes down to is those individual supervisors, peers, seeing even if you're going to a silly, what we all sit here and laugh about as a, as a ridiculous resiliency day. Well, 80% of the people there, it might not be a big deal to 85% even. And by a corporate standard, if I get 85% of the people on board or I have an 85% solution to something, I've won. We, as the individual supervisors and peers of people, need to be in tune enough to pick up as much as we can of that 15%. That is why we are there. That is why we have the roles and responsibilities that we do. And, and I think we're back to the original discussion of how do we go about it. There's how from individual and there's how as a as a leader or as a as a supervisor. So uh, talking about slowing down and you also mentioned, for example, well, I had a list of five things I got done today and I only got three done. I like to look at it as sure. I only got three done, but hey, I got three things done. You know, I'm not going to get 100 percent of my goals every day. And of course, that works both for individual and uh, even institutional level goals, you know. Um, but I would also add to like each of us should with ourselves, but also promote to others. Um, take an inventory, honestly, what's what's important to you? Like of those five things, how many of them actually mattered to either you or to the place where you work? You know, did you even need to invest any time or resources or anyone else's time or resources to get in those goals done? I think we spend a lot of time just focusing on stuff that doesn't matter in the end. So taking the inventory of those things is very important. And my cuckoo clock's going off, so one moment, please. And that's it. You timed it. You meant to do that. <laughs> Bravo. Uh, this goes right in line with all of those same things, and this is from Atomic Habits, so I know Jerbo will love it. Uh, but this is a simple quote using numbers to make it very readily apparent how, like you were saying, Mario, just ending with one plus versus no negatives or heck, even a neutral is still better than losing. Uh, and I'll just read the quote real quick so I don't screw it up. Uh, you don't realize how valuable it is to just show up on your bad or busy days. Lost days hurt you more than successful days help you. If you start with $100, then a 50% game will take you to $150. But you only need a 33% loss to take you back to $100. In other words, avoiding a 33% loss is just as valuable as achieving a 50% gain. As Charlie Munger says, the first rule of compounding, never interrupt it unnecessarily. So I think that's what we got we to gotta come back to is, did, did you win today? Did you at least have a win, right? Or did you have more wins than losses? Because if you did, you're ahead. And if you had some losses, it happens, right? It's not the end of the world, right? That's what everybody it seems like feels like a day that is a loss or there are losses. It's a total freaking loss. And what does fail stand for, right? First activity and learning. So it's not a loss if you learn something from it. It is totally a loss if you just freaking throw in the towel and quit, right? And you're not resilient. So that's where being resilient would come back into play. So it made me think about like some of the training we get, whether it's ECAC or um you know anti-terrorism this or that or whatever but like we always talk about small victories and think about being in a prison cell you know where you're just a battle of wits against somebody else i mean you're going to lose 99 percent of the time but you might have that one small victory and i think resiliency in terms of what we're talking about it, it's kind of a comparable topic i was going to type it in the thing as you were talking but uh somebody somebody uh previously taught me uh doing doing little things in big ways uh you know looking for those opportunities and they were they were telling us that each day is full of opportunities big ones small ones and everything in between 
And sometimes when we feel like we're just not accomplishing anything or not being productive or just sucking at life or at least feeling like it that day, like sometimes I'll have to slow the pace down where it's like, oh, I have an opportunity to hold the door for somebody at the supermarket and be nice to them. Like that's an opportunity. That's an example of taking advantage of an opportunity, doing something little, but just doing it as well as I can. Um, that's just what I was thinking as you were talking. So, um, change the uh, degree of a plane on takeoff by one. And you, if it's flying across the country, it'll wind up in Mexico instead of Los Angeles. That's how uh, it takes atomic one Atomic habits degree. as well. That's right. Atomic habits. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I dig it. I dig it. Um, one, one of the other things I wanted to bring up is, um, we talked about this before the thing. Um, what happens when we're not resilient or taking that knee or slowing the pace down? I think, Paz, you mentioned that it, it's not really not being resilient. It's 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 actually part of being resilient uh, of what it actually means. It's not it's not being like made of Teflon where all this struggles coming in pew 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 it just doesn't affect you at all you retain the same shape but when you get hit and you get dented by things you you slow down and sometimes you do have to maybe get out of the way and then figure out a better course forward is that kind of what you were talking about it's not just giving up but it's it's part of it yeah i think it's I think resiliency is in inherently continuing on the fight. The pace may change. Some of the objectives might change. Uh, you know, and, and I think I think if you do some self-reflection, you can look at, uh, I, I think even an example of that could be is, where, how did you think the Air Force was going to go? You know, at first you showed up to basic training and the first day, you know, because you don't know anything, you're like, I'll be done with this in six weeks and I'm going to EOD school and shit, I'm going to be running this place in no time. And then after about day two, you're like, what in the hell did I get into with myself here? You know, and you're and you're like, holy crap, I'm overwhelmed. But you you may have. You had people around you, you had that were going through the same thing, you know, commonality and struggle. You had uh, you had times where you it slowed down, you know, and, and once it slowed down, you could progress again. You know, maybe you were going a little bit a little bit too fast. And then you look at, you know, you went to your shop and man, I'm going to I'm going to be I'm going to be a team leader in no time. Well, hold on a second. I got to get through this training. And if you had good trainers, they went, ah. You don't exactly know what you're doing, buddy. So come here a second. You know, we're going to go through this. And you had to slow that back down. And it's it's almost like finding your, your confidence and proficiency level and trying to keep them evened out together because at certain times your 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 confidence gets going above your above your uh, proficiency level. And then the world starts going too fast creating hard times, creating things you need to take a step back from. And it can be the other way where if you get so comfortable and so, hey, I'm I'm good at what I do and I'm content with that. Well, I, I would argue that you're preventing yourself from being ready for situations you may need to be resilient in because you you could your whole career you could say, well, I'm not going to be chasing stripes and doing all these things. Well, things happen. Somebody's going to put you in charge of something at some point. It's the way the world works. And then because you didn't prepare yourself. Now you're in the seat that you didn't want to begin with. And you're like, oh, my goodness, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to be resilient and and keep moving. So that's that's a little I, I know I tangented way off of what you asked me, but I I I think it applies somehow, maybe because I'm still talking about resiliency, but that'd be about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can you can be. Uh, you can prepare as much as you can. Um, there's, what was it, a, a quote? There's like, 
being prepared and opportunity comes knocking or some shit like that. I don't know. It's a fancy quote. I think Brad probably knows that it's like success is the intersection of preparation and opportunity or something like that. I, I can't remember. To, to, to ask a blunt question. If can you guys speak to to one thing how not not institutional not not program level nothing but you as individuals can you speak to one thing that helps you remain resilient or that help that fortifies it that helps you one thing it doesn't have to be anything specific but obviously the more specific the better Brad. Knowing I don't always have to be resilient because I am fortunate enough to have one hell of a group of friends around me, you know, the circle. They say two to five and struggle well, but I think mine's a little larger. And um, it's like a safety net for me. And that's what I worry about is people that don't have that. What do they do? Um, so for me, that's what helps me to not only be resilient, but know that it's okay if I'm not, because those people will. You know, like we talked about with disclosure, I can unload my ruck a little bit. They'll carry the weight for me, and then I'll do the same for them when that time comes. Um, so that's what helps me. And in the end, um, well, no, I'll, I'll save that for later. Um, so what I tell myself is, sure, I might have fucked something up today, but I won't do the same thing tomorrow. And as of yesterday, I've been on this earth for 39 years. And if I've made it this far and done all right, I'm going to do OK tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. I think I think for me, uh, what allows me to to be able to do, I guess what we were calling taking a knee or a, or a pause is. Uh, my wife. Uh, and, you know, walk with me on this one. Uh, I, I lucked out and married somebody who, as I view from my perspective, is extremely capable. So capable that she can, she's, she's like, I got your back. Stay, you know, just do you. Get you squared away, and then you can pick this rucksack back up. And, uh, and um, you know, I can do that for her as well. Um, and that's not to say I don't have a lot of EOD people in my life and, and others that, that I've learned from and continue to learn from. But if I was to say there was one, one, you know, where is the, the closest example of that? It, it, it's that I, I know I know she'll carry it for a couple of days or however long it needs to be until it's my turn to, to pick it back up and carry for her. And uh, so, yeah, that's many 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 examples i mean group of people right here as well i i know if i know if i brought my rucksack over every one of you would pick it up and say i got you so so there's tons of examples that's that is just the closest one for me i think one of the one of the things that helps me is it, like sayings or, or or things that i keep reminding myself i don't want to go so far as to say it's a mantra but I actually uh, got this from one Aaron Weber, uh, and uh, that's this too shall pass. Uh, that when I'm in the throes of whatever I'm in the throes in, and I, I feel like I'm I'm deep in that foxhole of of sucky shittiness, uh, and it doesn't seem like I can see the light of day and get through it, knowing that this will pass, like. It won't last forever. It might feel like it, but I know that it's not going to last forever, that there is something else on the horizon. There is always something else on the horizon for me because like you, Omloff, I've been here X amount of years, a little more than 39. Uh, and yeah, and I'm still here, and although I've had a metric shit ton of experiences that felt like I would never get through them, guess what? I got through them, and I survived, and I'm better now because of it. And man, there was a metric shit ton of learning as well. So, um, yeah, that, that's that's kind of my thoughts on that. When we 
when we look at the definition of resilience and we talked about bouncing back and uh, n- n- deforming temporarily and going back to the original shape, the question I have is, is there a need to go back to the original state? I think that's a big part of the issue with with uh, you know the toxic resilience of just be resilient, be resilient, right? Is people pursue an almost impossible goal sometimes of trying to go back to the way things were, and there are times, not always, but there are times where that is not possible. Yet people continue to pursue it, and that takes them down a very very negative, bad path. And um, I think that's why we need to be careful about telling people, you know, just be resilient and bounce back. Well, how about I bounce forward instead and I bounce somewhere else that's different and is new and is a better version of me, which goes right back to the post-traumatic growth stuff, especially, you know, that's kind of the summary of a, an excerpt from Transformed by Trauma is, you know, this, uh, this guy who was, who was hurt in Afghanistan tried to do that and it led him down a path of alcoholism and just horrendous experience. And when he stopped trying to go back to the way things were before he got hurt, life turned around for him. And that's not to say that that was the only thing that happened. It's a nuanced, complex situation by all means. However, that's a big part of it. Um, If you continue to try to fight things and force things to be the way they were, that's when you start to break things. If things naturally come back to that, then maybe you can get some of that back. Uh, But this goes back to what we talked about a long time ago too, about why creativity is so important, because then you can find new ways and be thinking about new ways to move forward. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like the element of impermanence is, is is a big part of that. You know, I I thought about the analogy of being a captain of a ship and how the captain wants to just want smooth waters. Um, but they're not really the best captain, you know. It's like all smooth sailing and there's nothing to it, like. They're not exercised. They don't have the best skills. But damn it, when you're the captain of the ship and you're like going like this, you're like, motherfucker, this thing sucks, right? And it's like, how am I going to get through this? Look at the size of that fucking wave, right? But then you get through it and you're like, oh, I know how to handle that now. And I guess that's 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 kind of the point is it's not always going to stay the same. It's not always going to be literally where the saying comes from, smooth sailing. It's not always going to be that way. So how does how does one get used to navigating that kind of stuff? By being in those different situations and adapting to the flow of things, adapting to the environment. I mean, I think it's fair to say that the current geopolitical climate is has felt quite dynamic. And so maybe learning how to surf through that and with that, rather than banging one's head on the wall and just wanting things to not be a certain way or to be a certain way, like that, that mentality is not productive, but learning how to navigate that stuff I think is 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 where um, I don't know thriving happens is, is the best way you know because I don't know it seems like a lot of people are getting stuck on things and it's really easy to get stuck. I've been stuck on things in the past. Jason, navigating through those difficult times with the mindset of this too shall pass. Knowing that it will change, knowing that it can and will get better. Um, if you haven't, if if an individual hasn't gone through something, um, and that whatever that something is looks different for everybody. For some, for some people, it can be like Paz said, their second day of basic training. That's the farthest they've ever been pushed. And they're like, what the hell did I get myself into? For others, it's D-Day. It it varies greatly. And there's, we've mentioned this before, there's no ruler of pain and discomfort. It's, It's all subjective to the individual who's experiencing it. Um. But you're exactly right. Knowing that other people have gone through similar things 
and have come out the other side and not only are better for it, but they're actually talking about it and they're sharing how they felt when they went through and some of the things that they did to get through it and where they are now. That to me is the meat and potatoes of what we're trying to do. We're not trying to monopolize our pain and use it as, oh, it's this thing, but yeah, it sucked. It's going to suck for other people. This is how I got through it. It might help. Maybe 10% of what we're talking about might help other people, but as long as people know that this too shall pass, I think I think that's going to go a long ways. There's one quote I wanted to did want to say from yeah. uh, that transformed by trauma excerpt um, that kind of talks about uh, post traumatic growth and resiliency, right? And uh, the, the quote goes, "Yeah, freaking love that book." And Kintsugi is an awesome concept. Uh, resilient people tend to have less disruption to their beliefs following trauma. So people who are not resilient to a trauma are more likely to experience growth. So I just think it's important to remember that as a, hey, if I'm being beat down by something, number one, you're a human being, you're, you're not a cyborg, you're not a T-1000 or 4000 or whatever they're up to now. Um, you have emotions, even men, believe it or not. And it's okay to be beat down by things. And, and I would say this all the time when I was talking to ALS about post-traumatic growth, if, if I would have lost Tim, Dan, and Liz and come home and had zero emotional reaction, I would have been a sociopath, right? So uh, it's important, though, when you're at that part, when you lose people close to you or some other traumatic event happens, that you don't lose the hope and the faith coming back to the Stocktail paradox, right? Don't pin everything on magical stuff that has no bearing on outcomes, but at the same time, never lose hope and faith that you will get through whatever is happening to you. That's how they got through like up to seven or eight years and I know it helped me. Um, but, you know, with this whole sledgehammer of resilience that keeps getting beat on people and how it's become a buzzword, everybody just thinks, you know, I'm rubber, you're glue, fucking bing, bounce off me, sticks to you, right? And I have to be that way always. And if I'm broken, I just go to mental health and everything's fixed. And that is not at all how it happens. There's so much more to it than that. And there's value in being broken sometimes, just like that bowl on the front of that book. They, they put those bowls back together with gold flaked paint uh, in the glue on purpose, because look at that bowl now. Now that bowl, there's no other bowl like that bowl. The, the cracks and imperfections of that bowl are highlighted and it makes it a more beautiful bowl and it's shared with the world. So it's important to remember that and that you don't have to always be resilient. And it's, it's humanly impossible, in fact, and I mean the word humanly as serious as possible there. Something to consider. Any any thoughts, any additional thoughts on, on the topic of resiliency, toxic resiliency? Um, any final thoughts, anything we haven't gone over? Uh, I think that we need to be careful with the toxic resilience and got to give you credit for coining that term. And I think we need to understand that it's a much more complex issue than something you can just get magically fixed, right? It's not a broken arm. Uh, we're talking about the human mind. And uh, there's some interesting studies out there that talk about uh, the current attempts to fix it with chemical changes via medications and, and how ineffective they really can be in terms of actually treating the illness and then have horrific side effects in addition, right? Uh, I had a quick example, somebody I know had serious depression, was on Wellbutrin, and one of, I looked at the bottle and it said, make cause increased risk of suicide. Why are we taking this? What are we doing here, right? Chemical imbalance might not be the actual answer despite what we've been told for the past 30 or so years. So we gotta be careful with just saying, be resilient and then no follow up to the complexities and nuances of be a human being, right? Um, and then the last one little closing thought I'd like to throw out, and then I'll pass the mic to Paz as we uh, wrap up this wrap. Uh, is uh, I was listening to a Kyle Carpenter podcast yesterday when I was driving a rental car up to Pittsburgh to go get that bike. And uh, towards the end of it, he was interviewing uh, something Chris Cassidy, I think his name is. He's a Navy SEAL, he is uh, like an Iron Man guy, and he's an astronaut, all kinds of really, really cool, crazy stuff. But uh, they like, kind of towards the end, they talked about this real simple quote that I think ties into this very nicely. It's uh, uh, 
uh, comfort and growth do not coexist. So don't forget that. Yeah, that is a uh, man. It's almost like you don't want to say anything after a quote like that. That's uh, that's well put. I think there's I think there's things you can do as an individual to be more resilient, and there are things you can do as you know if you want to be a leader or somebody that helps others be more resilient. But I think they all stem around the same thing, and that's honesty and humility. Um, if you if you can be humble. You know, if if you can have the humility as an individual to say I'm having a tough go of it, uh, but have the humility, you know, when you get to that leadership position to say, you know, I know you guys are you guys and girls are looking up to me as somebody that's made it or that looks like it's all going. Perfect. Well, it's like that duck swimming on the water, right? The the you know, you're kicking like crazy underneath and I think, you know, opening that up and showing the transparency, being honest about that, I think are good things. And, you know, I think that's, you know, I just think it's whatever level you're at, you know, although the the how it manifests or how it's explained is differently. Um, I think you'd find those as like, you know, very common, you know, or or like the core pieces in, in whatever plan you kind of come up with or are part of to be resilient. So I got the term authentic leadership came to mind as as you were talking about that and uh, yeah being congruent you know what you put out and what you are the closer those are aligned you know, I, I don't know how many leaders people i've been around where what they put out to other people and then what they put out behind closed doors sometimes are very two ends of the spectrum and to me that's not being authentic and i i think people can see that over time so the the, the closer the congruency can be uh the better the outcome um that's that's kind of where my brain went as you were as you were talking um but yeah i don't my 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 closing thought is that you know, the quote unquote resiliency isn't the situation where when everything, when all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. Like every problem doesn't need the resiliency hammer to smack it down. Be resilient, be resilient, be resilient. Like that's this magical fix on everything. Well, let's let's maybe look into a little bit more, understand the quote unquote atmospherics and you know take a look at it as necessary whether we're talking the individual that needs help that was told you know to go to mental health and they can't to more organizational things um but yeah that's that's all i'll i'll end with my piece with that jason you got any anything you know i was just thinking about this when you started talking about hammers and nails you know a hammer's got two sides of it You've got the part that wax nails in, but then you've also got the claw that rips nails out. Sometimes hammers need to be put into place, and sometimes you need to yank those fuckers out and just get rid of them. That is true. I mean, it all depends on what kind of hammer you have. Sometimes you have dual-sided hammers, you know. The other one has a blade on it. I don't know if we want to cut people, you know. Brad, what do you got? <laughs> Uh, so something we talk a ton about post-traumatic growth on like all of these talks it's, and we had one specifically on the subject, uh, but it always comes back like many other of these topics and subjects do. And I think hopefully at the end of this, you know, we're not trying to say resilience is bad. We're not trying to say that you, you should never even use the word or whatever. It's a buzzword, which means it means nothing. It's not really the, the point of what we're getting at here. I think uh, the point is there's, there's a continuum of resilience and there's there's a side that's almost zero and there's a side that's you know I'm rubber your glue right uh, but there's also so much in between and a lot of the in between when it comes to traumatic experiences you know things that shatter you and shape you not getting a flat tire on the way to work or losing your goldfish or breaking up with a girlfriend from a week 
Um, but you know, maybe a parent dying or some of your friends being killed in a car crash or who knows something like, uh, there's so many examples of trauma out there. Right. Uh, but possibly just like this book suggests, and I'll read the quote here in a second, post-traumatic growth can eventually lead to resilience. And we should be careful about putting that cart before the horse, because more often than not, when it's like legit resilience that we're talking about, we need to make sure that it's in the right steps in the right order. If we just try to go from yesterday, my dad died to be resilient tomorrow, you're skipping a whole bunch of steps, which means resiliency is not going to happen. Right. And uh, the way this quote goes, uh, one important relationship between resilience and post-traumatic growth comes after a person has been in the post-traumatic growth process for a while. When core beliefs are rebuilt in a better form, they're better able to withstand future traumas. Therefore, People who have a stronger set of core beliefs are becoming more resilient. We can, therefore, say that post-traumatic growth provides a pathway to resilience. So something to consider.